This past Sunday, I wasn't with you. I was in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, Brooklyn was a lot of fun. I'm grateful for those brothers, uh, Brother Stevenson and uh, Brother Gain, who accompanied me. Uh, and uh, we were able to just share at a church in, the, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and while I was there, I knew y'all was praying for me. And the thing that blessed my soul is I was there, and they had two services. They had an 8 o'clock and an 11 o'clock. And so I got a chance to catch worship a little bit in the between time. And so I was, I was with y'all a little bit on last Sunday, at least as much as I could be. And then I watched the, the rebroadcast on our way back home. And I just praise the Lord for this house. Amen. You know, like, I used to be a part of another church, and I praise the Lord for that church and that time frame and that experience. But there's something about not being here and missing being here. Amen. Okay, maybe there's like three of y'all who are witnesses to that. You know, like, when I'm not here, I'm like, dag, man. I need to be home, man. I'm not home. I'm like here, and it's not home. You know, and that just wasn't what it was before. I'm sorry, you know, my people. It just wasn't was what it was before. But I praise the Lord for what this is. I also want to share something with you uh, for those of you who were here and have been here with us the last month or so at least. Um, as you know, if you were here last Sunday, Pastor Nice shared some meat. He shared some meat, y'all. Meat, meat, meat. Meat, y'all. You know, it was meaty. Like, I had to watch it twice nice. First time, I was a little tired, and I was drifting off. Second time, I was like, whoa, this is meat. Meat. But it wasn't just about the word that was shared. What it was really about was the response of our house. And I'm pleased to share with you that last Sunday, we raised that keyboard money. This blesses my heart. You know why it blesses my heart? Because it says that we get it as a collective. We get it. We aren't outsiders or spectators. We're, we're, we're sons and daughters of a house. We ain't even just members, right? Members. Y'all remember what I said about members? Y'all remember? No? Some of y'all probably remember. This, this isn't original to me, but I'll share it again. Planet Fitness has members. Planet Fitness has members where there's a judgment-free zone. That don't exist in this house. We have sons and daughters. And sons and daughters under the teaching of this house are corrected by the teachings of this house and walk as the Lord guides us. You can't be in a house and not abide by the rules laid out by the father. Why? Because you know what happens? I don't know what happened growing up in your house, but you know what happened if we didn't abide by the rules in my house? I'm going to say this in a Haitian Creole because, you know, that's kind of was the rules in my house. Baton. <laughs> For those who understand that. Baton meant beat down. I don't know if that's how you really translate that, but that's what it meant. Beat down. There was no uh, suggestive following of the rules. It was you following, boy. <sighs> Today is our last Sunday of this current series. There is a lot going on in the month of November. It's Thanksgiving week. Uh, so we're excited. How many of y'all excited about Thanksgiving? Yeah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> y'all greedy. Now let me stop. But... But uh, uh, a lot of us are excited about Thanksgiving. We get to see family. Uh, matter of fact, who, Lady and Fred and I are, I think we have 30 that are going to be at our house for Thanksgiving. Pray for us. Pray for us. They coming from all over. All over. So pray our strength in the Lord. Yes, Lord. You know? Fred always want to host stuff. I've been telling her, you know, like I grew up, we didn't host no Thanksgiving. We just went. We just went. And I... We took our Tupperware and we went and made stops. You know what I mean? But, but that's not how Fred get down. Fred, Fred want to host. I'm like, for real? Okay. 
But in any event, I'm digressing. So this Tuesday, leading up to Thanksgiving, we are having a church-wide potluck, Thanksgiving-style celebration. Y'all supposed to say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's going to be a good time. We're not going to have Bible study as normal. We're going to have food, and we're going to share why we're thankful in this season. And we're just going to have a chance to fellowship and interact. So it's my prayer that you can join us. We're here at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, and we're not meeting in this room. We'll be meeting in the multi-purpose room. Amen. And the rest of the stuff, please, you know, uh, uh, check out our Facebook or our, our website, whatever, and uh, stay connected with all that's happening in the house. Today we're going to be ending our sermon series on sonship, spiritual sonship, and I want to start off, I want to start off our time of sharing today with the story that comes from this book, You Have Not Many Fathers. There was a man in the early days of my pastorate in Fort Worth named David. David was introduced to us by a nurse named Pat, who was a member of our congregation. She worked at a rest home where David was a resident. David used to work as an engineer who created, designed, and tested safety equipment within jet airplanes. But one day, David was testing an ejection set and had fully armed the device he was seated in to make sure it functioned properly. Actual operation was never intended in this test module. A reckless workman came by and released the lever that propelled David 40 feet into the steel rafters of the building. When they removed David from the infrastructure of the ceiling, he was breathing and alive, but his entire body was completely paralyzed. David had been in a paralyzed condition for several years when Pat informed some men in our church that his doctors had asked for some volunteers to assist in giving David therapy. The theory was that if a few people repeated infantile crawling or swimming with David's limbs, that nerve endings and connections would grow back to their original state. The problem wasn't broken bones or crushed limbs, but that the connection between David's head and his body was totally severed. Since he was not able to respond or move at all, the doctors were not able to ascertain whether David was even aware of anything. He couldn't even blink his eyes. So they laid him on a bed where he stared straight into the overhead lights, which eventually burned out his retinas, caused him to become blind. He couldn't chew, so they fed him with a tube directly into his stomach. They massaged his stomach area to allow his digestive system to function properly. David couldn't even lick his lips and they would become parched and cracked and bleed. We would roll him over on his face on a narrow table, his face munched down to the, into the leather pad. A man would grab each dangling appendage and start the swimming, crawling motions that his therapy consisted of. I went in one day, and the doctor was in the hall outside David's room. His back against the wall, he looked extremely disturbed. Noting the tortured look on his face, I asked the doctor, what was troubling him? The response shocked me. He said, if I could take a gun and shoot David dead and kill him, I would. I asked, what in the world is wrong? The doctor explained that men had come from Chicago the previous week and tested some new neurosurgical equipment. They put electrodes down in David's head to see if there was any brain activity. Unable to respond by blinking or squeezing a hand, the doctors assumed that David could not hear or even think. The doctor was reading the equipment in an area next to David's room, making notes on the data in David's chart, when suddenly all the dials flashed far into a red area and monitors began to hum. This was incredibly unusual, and the physician went to look in the window of David's room. David's wife had just walked into the room and said, Hi, David, how are you? His boys briskly flashed by the bed, hi, dad, hi, dad, and then sat at a nearby table and did their homework. When the doctor entered the room, the wife was talking to an aide. This man does not know who I am. I'm lonely, and my husband is as good as dead to me. I know I'm his wife, and I want to be faithful to my husband, but he's been gone for six years lying in this place. I don't have any more feelings towards this person that's before me. I'm going to file for divorce. 
The doctor said the machine hummed and the dials hung on red for hours before they started quivering back down. The doctor now knew for certain, for the first time in six years, that there was nothing wrong with David's mind. His understanding and his mental faculties were aware of his situation, but his body just wouldn't receive any instructions from his head. Now that's a crazy story, y'all. But in a lot of ways, it kind of puts into summation this entire series. There's nothing wrong with the head of the church. The head of the church is Christ, right? Nothing wrong with the head of the church. But there seems to be a stark disconnection between the head and the body. It's almost as if the head is trying to send directions to the church. And for whatever reason, the church isn't carrying out or able to really hear what's being said, or at the very least, actually listening to what's being said from the head. Why do you say this, Pastor Manny? I'm so happy you ask. Let's think about this just for a moment. If Jesus is the head, right? And Jesus, when he was here on earth, said the church is supposed to do even greater things than he did. Where the greater things at? If we, the body, the church, are supposed to carry out his message and his mandate to make disciples sharing the good news, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and doing this, to the ends of the earth, where is that at? Where's that at? There's a disconnect somewhere along the line. There's a disconnect from the head to the body. Today, we're going to be sharing a message entitled Nerve Endings Restored. Nerve Endings Restored. You see, when there's this disconnect in our nervous system, the nerves that send our messages down to the other extremities of our body, what happens is because there's a disconnect, there's pain at the site of the disconnect. And there's an inability for a continuation of communication to take place. There's an inability for nerves that are carrying messages from our brain to different parts of our body to actually carry those messages because along the way there's this severing, this disconnect. What has to happen in these circumstances, in these situations? I dare say what it really boils down to is a bridge has to reconnect our nerves so that we can properly function. We need a bridge. We need a bridge. But here's the problem. Bridges are hard to come by. I live uh, next to this bridge that went out on Winter Street. The bridge on Winter Street went out. And you know what happened? It took them six months to fix this bridge. And here's what had to happen, too. Because the bridge was out, we had to travel like two miles down the road to then travel two miles back up the road to get back to where we was trying to go. Y'all's following me here. It's almost like you've got to do this huge detour to try to get to where you're going, and oftentimes a detour along the way, you get caught up and you can't get back to where you're trying to get at. Turn to someone next to you and say, we need a bridge. We need a bridge. We need a bridge. When the bridge is made, then the sun rose as he's connected to his father and that son actually becomes a father in his own right and that son now father makes other sons that's the pattern that's the divine order set out from the lord from jump yet the bridge the bridge is out and there seems to be this disconnect two two kings chapter two is the story of elisha and what we see here is an affirmation of this exact point, how the bridge is needed. 
If you look at this screen, you'll see this text, and it reads, And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Verse 10. So he said, you have asked the hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taking from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Heaven literally affirms Elisha's sonship. How so? What Elisha asked for is exactly that. He asked for a double portion, which is the inheritance due to a son. And what heaven does is as, as Elijah is taken up, into the whirlwind, up into heaven, what happens? His cloak falls down, and that double portion that he requested, the proof of his sonship, is granted to him. Elisha is a son of his spiritual dad, Elijah. And you know what? Heaven affirms it. Heaven affirms it. Heaven affirms it. It was the same way with Jesus. Do you remember? Jesus couldn't do any ministry until heaven affirmed that this was the Lord's son with whom the Lord was well pleased. You remember that at Jesus' baptism? Jesus baptized, right? And before Jesus is baptized, he's still Jesus. But the affirmation from heaven hadn't come yet. And so he couldn't walk as a son fully yet until heaven affirmed his sonship. Now, what does all of that mean? What's the point of all of that? What's that got to do with this disconnect? Here's the heart of God. Until we understand what the bridge is, we can't walk over the bridge. Amen? The bridge is sonship. That's the bridge. The bridge is sonship. And we've got to come to a place where we truly are sons. Where we truly are sons. And here's what's crazy. For many of us, we get this. We cognitively understand this. We understand that we're supposed to be followers of Christ. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus and follows Jesus' example. right? We understand that piece. But the disconnect here is that even though we understand it and we hear it, we're unable to actually live it because we're not committed to this pattern of this bridge. You know what's crazy? What's crazy is oftentimes rather than doing, following God's directives, we kind of argue with God. We kind of say stuff like, God, okay, I know I'm supposed to do X, but God, that's just not comfortable for me in this season. Or God, I don't want to do that. Or God, yeah, you know, I know I shouldn't be, you know, sleeping with my girl, but, you know, she looked good and it's natural. You know what I'm saying? You created this anatomy thing. God, I'm just trying to fulfill your purpose. And we try to almost connive God. Maybe not you, you know what I'm saying? We are super Christians. But we try to justify our doing our own thing rather than following God's pattern. There's this passage in John, John chapter 12, where Jesus is approached by these two guys. Uh, and as he's approached, they approach, they're trying to speak with Jesus, trying to get an audience with Jesus. And they go to Jesus' disciples. And as they go to Jesus' disciples, eventually Jesus gets word that these two guys want to meet with him. And then instead of answering the question, will he meet with these two guys, you know what Jesus says? Jesus goes into this uh, what seemingly kind of side st story. He starts saying, unless a grain falls to the ground, it can't ever die and then produce, produce wheat, right, and produce fruit, right? And then and he begins to say, it's not about ultimately meeting with these guys. He doesn't even acknowledge these guys' requests. If you jump in the story in the text, verse number 27 of John chapter 12, it reads this. Jesus now begins to utilize the opportunity to begin to reiterate really the whole entire purpose of why he's here. Verse 27 of John 12. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it 
said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, the voice didn't come because of me, but for your sake. I want to make sure you see this. Look at verse 29 particularly. This voice from heaven speaks, right? And you know what the people hear? They, some say they heard thunder. Some say they heard an angel. Ain't none of them say they heard God. You want to know why? Because there's this disconnect, y'all. In order to hear God, you actually got a desire to hear God. In order to hear God, there's actually got to be a willingness in you to then carry out what God says. You know what happens when there's not that willingness in you? Everything God says is muffled. 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 And then you're uncertain. You're like, did God really say this? Or did God really do say that? So I don't know what I should do. So I'm just going to do what I want to do. Because the disconnect. Some hear thunders. Others hear an angel. No one hears God. And friends, I kid you not. This is the condition that exists in so many of our churches today. And it breaks my heart because it causes us to live apart from God's divine order and plan and blessings for us. We're not sons. We're not daughters. And as a result, we don't have the inheritance and the birthright of sons and daughters. Disconnected. Disconnected from our head. Someone who is disconnected from their head is as good as dead. As good as dead. I want to place this in a little bit more context here. Here's the heart of God for us. We've got to understand that this disconnection is as a result of, yes, our pride, but even beyond that, this is about the spiritual warfare that we're in that's longing to keep us apart from God's design for us. You are in a fight, friends. You are in a spiritual fight, friends. And what that spiritual fight looks to do is dismember you. The enemy's not playing games with you. He is trying to kill you. And the way in which he does this is he looks to discredit the voice of God so that you don't hear what it is the Lord is asking of you. There are three states of nerve ending disconnect. I want to go through these three states and then I'm going to end today. But these three states have incredible parallels. The three states are self-repairable, assisted repair, unrepairable. Y'all kind of know I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to uh, uh, some of this science stuff. Y'all have been here long enough, or many of you have been here long enough, that know while I'm not no connoisseur, what happens in nature always intrigues me, particularly about its spiritual parallels. So the first state is self-repairable. Some nerve damage, although there's been a fracture in the nerve itself, the ending is pretty close to the other side. And because their proximity is close, they can reconnect. It's not a huge sever, usually a little partial tear. And because of it, more often than not, that realignment, reconnection can actually happen pretty easily. It's almost like, have you ever had a friend that you haven't talked to in a while, but that was your boy or that was your girl? Right? And then the minute you connect back with them, it's like nothing ever passed. Y'all begin to connect again, and it's almost as if there was never this break. Y'all, does that ever happen to y'all? Right? That happens to me all the time. Well, maybe not all the time, but y'all y'all get what I'm saying. Now, here's the heart of God for us in this picture. Many of us aren't so disconnected that we can't come back to God. What the enemy might look to convey to you is that you can't come back. They're going to say this about you. They're going to say that about you, right? And it's a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie from the pit of hell. You're a lot closer than you think. As a matter of fact, turn to someone next to you and say, you're a lot closer than you think. 
God is sitting there with arms wide open just wanting to receive you. You're a lot closer than you think. It's not about you and your efforts anyway. It's not about you and your efforts anyway. But the word of the Lord to you is this. Go back home, man. Come home. Come home, come home, come home, come home, come home. And before you know it, it's going to be like you never left. The second one, assisted repair, the second stage. What was so interesting when I was looking at this was that it's ongoing research that's kind of uh, uh, propelling this stage. So most people who get nerve damage, they take some drugs, right? And they take some drugs, and the drugs don't heal the nerve damage. You know what the drugs do? They kind of numb the nerve damage. Right? You take some painkillers, and you feel better for a little bit, right? And then all of a sudden, after the painkillers wear out, then all of a sudden, boom, that pain is right there. It doesn't heal it. It doesn't make the connection. It simply kind of mask it for a time, right? Now, what's interesting about the science here, this current research is that currently researchers have developed, discovered that there are certain cells that actually in the body, in, nerve, in our nervous system, help to reconnect damaged nerves. There's certain cells, they're called Schwann cells. Schwann cells, y'all scientists probably could speak more to this than I can, but these Schwann cells literally help to connect damaged nerve endings back to each other. What they're trying to figure out now is how can they get the Schwann cells to be activated in, in, in uh, seasons of nerve damage. But those Schwann cells are there to assist in the reconnecting of the ruptured nerves. And here's the parallel. For some of us, things have happened. Things have happened in our relationships. Things have happened in our church experiences. We've been hurt. We've been hurt in our families. We've been hurt by what folks have said. We've been abused. We've been rejected. And here's the heart of God for you. Daughter, son, I know what you've been through, but you can still come back home. And you know the biggest piece of this? A lot of times what you're going through that you think that no one else can even fathom or understand, it's your brother right next to you, your fellow Schwann cell, that is there to help repair you back to the family. Do you know your breakthrough is often sitting right next to you? Sitting right next to you. Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, Schwann cell. Your brother next to you is often your key to your breakthrough. Your sister next to you is often your key to your breakthrough. The truth is some of us need help getting back in alignment with God's design. But here's God's heart. We've got to be willing, amen, we've got to be willing to ask for help and receive the help that's given. What happens to, for, so, for so many of us is that our pride ends up blocking us from actually walking and receiving our breakthrough. Our pride, our pride, our pride, our pride. But here's the last one. It's the one that I want to spend my remaining six minutes. Unrepairable. Stage three. This is when the damage is so great, what transpired was so traumatic in the natural that there's simply no way for these nerve endings to be brought back together. This was David's case at the beginning of our message today. The damage was so great that there was no way that there seems to be able to be any type of repair. Decades have passed, and the hurt that you experience has become so great that your heart's become calloused. You've experienced abuse, and you're like, I just can't do this stuff anymore. And we come to the place because what has transpired has been so long, it's marked us. We give up on the prospects of actually being made right with God and actually entering into a relationship that follows his pattern and his design. We give up on God because of what we've gone through. Because of what we've gone through, we feel as if God abandoned us. 
turn with me, if you would, to the book of Philemon. If you're familiar with Philemon's story, Philemon, y'all, was a slave. Philemon was a slave. And you know who was his slave owner? A pastor. Aw, man. Don't those kind of disconnect, right? So you would think that this pastor is supposed, this spiritual leader is supposed to extend grace, right? And compassion. But Philemon ends up running away from this pastor because this pastor, rather than extending this grace, I can imagine what transpired in the setting. You know, what Paul kind of alludes to in his letter to Philemon is that the slave, the slave's name was Onesimus. The slave Onesimus stole from the slave master and then ran off away from the slave master who happened to be a pastor. That's what trips me out, y'all. But here's the parallel of it, right? We, we're, we're actually living in this today, right? For many of, uh, of us, we've kind of seen and heard and some of us have even gone through this whole sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, right? And here's the heart of that. So many gave their lives and their livelihood to faith in this setting and then to get word and figure out and find out that there was this corruption happening in this setting where abuse was taking place. And when they found out and folks began to speak about their experience, what you begin to hear is, man, I can't ever go back to church. I can't ever go back into that setting where I was abused and rejected and hurt and spat on and talked about, particularly by someone who was supposed to be leader, by someone who was supposed to be leader. Oh, my friends, clearly Onesimus was wrong. He was wronged, and he did some wrong. But here's what happens in the story. That's where we end. You know what happens in the story? God allows Onesimus to run, and he runs right to Apostle Paul. And he runs from an earthly father, at least that's how he perceives it, to a spiritual father. And you know what we see play out as this goes forth? He runs to a spiritual father, and you know what happens? That spiritual father loves him. He loves him. And you know what becomes the bridge for him to go back into right relationship with the Lord and ultimately back with his master, Philemon? Love. Love is the bridge that will heal our hearts. Love is the bridge that will get us to come pa go past the place of being disconnected back into connection with God's design. Love. Maybe, you know, while scripture doesn't make this clear, but maybe he was abused at the hands of this spiritual, at, at the hands of Philemon. Maybe Onesimus was abused. We don't know. But what we do know is as a result of Paul's love to Onesimus, Onesimus comes into faith in Christ. He becomes a spiritual son. And all of a sudden, that was strained relationship and that harbored hatred and that disconnect that he had with Philemon is repaired by the love of Paul and the love of Onesimus. My friends, I'm not sure you get this today, and this is where we end. But I want to make sure you hear this loud and clear. The scriptures declare about love. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't parade itself. Love isn't puffed up. Love doesn't behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes for all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll all cease. Knowledge, it'll all cease. Everything else will vanish away. But love 
never fails. Love never fails. I'm not sure where you are today. I'm not sure where you are along those stages today. Maybe you're disconnected and you're pretty close, much closer than you think. Maybe you're in a place where you need a little bit of help to connect back to God's design to being the son or daughter that God desired. But maybe you're in a place where there's the nerve endings are so shattered that it's totally beyond repair. What I'm here to share with you today is this. Love can be a bridge over what is perceived as unrepairable. Love conquers all. How can you experience love? How can you come to a place where you can actually walk in that bridge? It starts with your surrender, and then it ultimately continues with your willingness to actually love, even if you've been hurt in your church experience in the past before. So we're going to close today, but I'm going to ask everyone here to bow their heads and close their eyes. Are you a son? Are you a daughter? If you're a son and a daughter, you need to have the spiritual father. It's God's divine design. You need to have a spiritual father. It's God's divine design. Some of us, however, are disconnected from that design. And we're in stage one where we're a lot closer than we even choose to acknowledge. Or maybe we're in stage two where we really need some help. Or maybe we're in stage three where we're so far off, it feels like nothing could be done given the years and the decades that we've gone through pain and hurt that we've harbored and carried. Regardless of where you might find yourself, if you feel like you're disconnected today while every eye is closed and every head is bowed, I'm just gonna invite you to just lift up your hands. I wanna pray for you doesn't matter what stage. The truth is, regardless of the stage, God is still calling you home. The response to your state is to come back home to your daddy. Because what you'll discover is that your daddy's been looking, looking, looking from the window waiting for you to come back home so then he can run to you on your journey and meet you even on the road and bring you back home and celebrate you because he's been longing for your return. If you're here and your hands lifted in this place because you feel like there's a disconnect, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these, your children. We thank you, Lord, for your divine design. But most of all, Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you sent Jesus Christ to be our bridge, our bridge back into right relationship with you so that we could follow your pattern, your design, and become sons and daughters, not stepsons, not strangers, but literally adopted, grafted into your family, heirs and co-heirs with Christ. Father, for every hand that's lifted up in this place today, Lord, what I pray for is that you might continue to do this work in their hearts that realigns them to your purpose. May they fall in love with you again. May they long to seek after your face. And may they come into relationship with a spiritual dad that, that they are submitted to your design and your plan. And they ultimately begin to walk in, in the benefits of the inheritance of being a son and a daughter of the most high God. Lord, I thank you for what you're beginning to do in this house. Lord, I, I'm already sensing, dear Father God, the rooting that you're doing. I pray, dear Lord, that as you plant us, Dear Father, that you enable us to understand and know that you're at work purposing 
purposing to prepare us to go forward as you call. Lord, there are hearts, though, in this place that struggle with unforgiveness, that struggle with just hurt and brokenness that they carry and anger and pain and rage, really, Lord, because of what they've experienced, sometimes in their family setting, sometimes in their church family setting. Lord, what we're praying for today more than anything is your healing and your peace. Your healing and your peace and our collective willingness to trust your process rather than our own. We thank you and honor you and give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.